Hi, I'm Greg Hunt and welcome to No Disputing That. I created this podcast to give you an in-depth look into the world of mediation and arbitration. Each episode I'll be having a conversation with one of the most renowned names in the field, plus some you may not have heard of yet. We'll cover a wide range of topics from ADR to other areas of the law and life in general. So get ready for a unique blend of thought-provoking discussions, plenty of laughter and occasional audio slip-ups. Today I'm here in Belfast for the first in-person recording of No Dispute In That. Before now they've all been done um, via Zoom. So I'm with John Keyes, who's the course director of the LLM in International Commercial Law and Dispute Resolution at Ulster University. Uh, We're sitting in John's office on the sixth floor of the new building at the university. Um, When I was here last year, this building wasn't finished yet. Uh, and actually, it's very uh, exceeded my expectations. It, it's it's got a great feel about the place, and really feels like a a really good active city campus university, um, which I think is what the intention was when when it was being built. So it's it's really good to be here again. Uh, so welcome, John. Thanks, Craig, and thanks for inviting me up onto your podcast. No problem. Um, for those of you who don't understand John's accent, um, <laughs> I'll try and put subtitles when we load this onto YouTube, um, which is ironic coming from me because sometimes people say they can't understand me. Um, but I think I speak very clearly and very slowly. Um, so John and I have um, known each other for a little while. Um, we sort of started working together, I think, was it before COVID or yeah. during COVID? Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, we were working on a an ADR working group, I suppose, mm. is, is one of the ways in which we had started to work together. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah, that was prior to COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So probably going back four or five years now, um, and then through that working group, actually, now John's mentioned it, so I've remembered it was very important. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that led to um Hunt ADR being invited to run the um mediation element of your um llm course yeah um and we did that last year and actually our second running of it is in about three weeks time yeah. uh, when i'll be here for for the week with the rest of the hunt adr faculty to to deliver that um so let's start with that mm. um you run this course yeah um you've introduced adr yeah i can give you a bit of a backdrop uh to why Mm -hmm. um, we did that. Uh, I suppose I have to go back a few years ago to the end of 2017. We had a program uh, based in our McGee campus, um, which had sort of fallen by the wayside a little bit and become neglected. And uh, the head of school had asked me to take a look at it. It was a commercial law master's. Um, so we did, myself and a couple of colleagues, um, as a team, uh, we started to engage with industry, uh, the legal industry, uh, the commercial legal industry more specifically, uh, several partners and firms, and we got uh, great feedback and assistance uh, from them as to what needed to be in the offering, because we were aware that um, there was a feeling within the legal industry that um, students were coming to them and then needing retrained that they weren't really fit for purpose, the mm-hmm. education that they received. So if we were going to have a specialist master's course, um, it seemed to us like a very sound idea to make sure that industry was involved in the shaping of that. And actually, the alternative dispute resolution aspect of the programme nearly came about by mistake. I was very interested in alternative dispute resolution. Um, I came from uh, a barrister practice uh, mm-hmm. route um, and had been lecturing part-time and then came became full-time in the university. But I, I could see that, um, that litigation wasn't the solution to a, a lot of disputes out there, mm. that, that there had to be better ways of, of uh, better outcomes for uh, clients. And I became very interested in that. But through one of the discussions with one of the um, senior partners in a leading commercial practice here in the city, it was at the end of a conversation and I just actually happened to ask him, uh, how much of your 
disputes um, are, you know, are, end up in alternative dispute resolution. And he told me that 90%, over 90% of their wow. disputes were resolved that way. Mm. And it was like a penny dropping with me that I started to think about that when I left. And I thought, well, we're not doing this at undergrad. Why not? Why are students being taught family law, company law, all these core tenets of law, but we're not teaching them about alternative dispute resolution. And yet, if they go into practice, that's going to take up 90% of their time. Yeah. It just seemed, it seemed wrong and, and uh, out of step, with that we were out of step. So uh, as a, um, a, a school here, a law school here in um, UU, we decided that we needed to correct that. But I wanted to take it a step further on the masters, and I wanted them to have exposure not only to general ADR, a sort of mm. catch-all module. I wanted something that was going to be more in depth with mediation. Mm-hmm. And originally, uh, those discussions happened with another mediation body here in Northern Ireland, and we uh, originally started talking about them coming in to do a few weeks, and then we got to thinking about it as a group as a uh, team internally here that well would it not be better actually if we qualified these students as mediators mm. um, yes there is a cost and an element to it but wouldn't that be fantastic um, and in fact that's pretty much what happened the discussions took a few months to get everything ironed out both internally and externally uh, we got signed, signed off and now our students qualify not only within LLM but they also qualify professionally mm-hmm. as a mediator, um, which is a, a, a massive, unique selling point um, because I'm not aware of anywhere in the British Isles mm. that marries uh, a master's programme in the way that we have. Mm. Yeah, there's other people who are doing me- covering mediation and covering it in detail, aren't there? But I don't think I've seen any others where the actual outcome is an accreditation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And... and as your students are getting into Civil Mediation Council accreditation at the moment, and we are looking to, to add to that. Yeah, and that, I suppose, was our main reason for wanting to move to, to your organisation, Greg, was um, it brought about that um, a, a more recognisable accreditation mm. worldwide. And the reason we had to start looking at that was two two real reasons. One is that the mediation needed to have a commercial focus mm-hmm. because that's why students were with us. But also we had increasingly students coming to us from South America, from Africa, from Asia, uh, from the Middle East, mm-hmm. and all of them uh, interested in the USP. But obviously that needed to carry some weight back in their home country. Mm. And we felt that this was a um, a more prestigious way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed, I mean, when we did the course last year, I think about 50% of the um, class were international students. Yeah. And I think from what you said to me, it's a little bit higher this year, yeah. if anything. Yeah, I think we're running at about 70% yeah. uh, on the programme at the moment. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So that, that's a great way of, of, you know, a lot of them go back to where they come from yeah. and they start practising as a mediator and they're, and they're, they're promoting the fact that they've got a... A civil mediation council stroke hunt ADR stroke Ulster University accreditation, yeah. um, which just is fantastic. It just helps to build that international presence. Yeah, in mediation, and a lot of them are lawyers already, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Predominantly, the international students that come to us are practicing lawyers in their home country. Um, but yes, absolutely. Uh, and the way I look at it is, we have um, these alternative dispute resolution ambassadors mm. no not not for you you or for for anybody in particular but for mediation yeah and for dispute resolution alternative dispute resolution in their home countries and mm. these students are very eager um because they're they're in legal practice like myself they come to it with um you know without rose t- tinted glasses but they can see that there's some real advantages yeah. to looking at mediation and arbitration and adjudication as ways to resolve disputes more quickly and more cost effectively and um, privately in, in some cases too, which is very important mm. to the parties. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And do you think, what, what do you think has been um, 
a reason why other universities have not done this? Well, it's hard to hard to climb inside the head of other universities. Um, I suppose um, they have tried and tested uh, programs that mm. they're very well supported in. So that, you know, why change a winning formula? Mm-hmm. Um, I think too that mediation, the likes it to take as an example, has been slow mm. to to really. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of people. Um, in the legal fraternity here in Northern Ireland that trained as mediators um, but never went on to practice in the area mm. um, and I suppose the, the, you know the, 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 it has been slow to take off I, can't, I, I have ideas possibly why that might be but nothing concrete um, mm. and nothing from a research point of view that yeah. pinpoints why that is mm. um, so yeah um in other parts of the British Isles, I'm I'm not that clear why that's the case. I have I am aware of one or two um, uh, newer programs which have alternative dispute resolution and mediation at the heart of it. Mm. Not that they qualify as mediators, I don't believe. Mm. But, uh, for example, I'm thinking of uh, our external examiners, uh, new program professor Brian Clark mm. at Newcastle University mm-hmm. has um, launched a master's program um, which has alternative dispute resolution at the heart of it as well. Yeah. So I think it, it's a developing area. It's it's nice that Ulster can take a lead on it for yeah. in, in this way. And, you know, as a law school, we um, have been around for just over 25 years. So uh, we, I suppose we don't have these strong t- traditions, but rather we see ourselves as being a little bit more nimble and being mm. able to um, develop where we see um, opportunities. Yeah, great. That's really interesting. So staying with the fact that we're at Ulster Uni, um, I have a, a bit of a, a theme through some of these podcasts mm. where I ask people to tell me something that's happened it can be within ADR or it could be generally in 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 your law lectures um something funny or unusual that's happened that you might want to share yeah it, it well there was one that really tested my mediation skills <laughs> um and it happened up in our McGee campus I had been teaching up there and um I just finished delivering a lecture and we were working uh, as a group in a workshop and uh, I, I sort of set the task and turned my back to sort of have a look at emails or something like that on my computer while the students were working on their on their task. And <clears throat> I heard a commotion, <clears throat> turned round and realised that uh, one of the female students had just thumped one of the oh, no. <laughs> uh, male students and um, a lot of sort of open mouths students surrounding them going oh, what's just happened so I, I was likewise sort of just looking at it all and then it suddenly dawned on me that I'm in charge of this class <laughs> I'm going to be sorting this out <laughs> so yeah we had to we had to step in <laughs> and um, try and resolve that particular dispute yeah um, uh, but all all well it ends well it, 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 it got resolved but yeah. Um, yeah it was one that I've yeah. never seen before you have to think on your feet yeah, yeah, a, similar, yeah. a similar thing happened to me once it was um, a mediation and I'm, I don't I've heard stories from people who do family mediation that mm. quite often there can be some aggro as we'd call mm. it um, but in commercial cases it doesn't happen so often you sometimes get a bit of shouting stuff but I remember um, a case where I was the assistant mediator and it was in the days that mediation was done through uh, a number of courts in mm. England. It was the Central London County Court. And the mediation room, because you were only given one room, was a dingy little room downstairs with no natural light. Um, and basically the parties had to shuttle in and out of this one room because you only got allocated one room. And I was the co-mediator with uh, a man called David Poole. And, and David was a great... He was very well known for his time-limited mediations, which is what these were. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, he died a few years ago. Um, And he was the mediator. And we had the parties. Now, your desk, John, is what? Would you say it's the depth of that is two foot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a similar-sized desk Mm -hmm. in in this room. 
and we had it was to do with the sale of a catering business and we had the two parties sitting opposite each other at the table and um during the opening statement one of them stood up and started really I'm not going to repeat it uh, on this podcast mm. started quite violently cursing the other one who also then stood up and started doing the same it's two women <laughs> and they they were very close to punches being yeah. sort of thrown and I was sitting there thinking what do I do and I was looking at David and David's just doing for for the benefit of those who can't see me at the moment the sort of calm down sort of action but to me not to them yeah. he wasn't he was he was keeping me from getting involved yeah, yeah. Mm. and he just let it play out yeah. And they didn't hit each other and they sat down. One of them sat down, the other one sat down. They looked exhausted. It felt like it was five minutes. It was probably about 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just said, okay, should we start again? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that was how he handled nice it. And that case then moved forward. They'd vented the frustration. They'd, they'd got the cursing out of the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I honestly can't remember if it settled or not that way. I really can't remember. <laughs> yeah. um, it was a long time ago. But it, it just showed that thing about mediation where you can allow the parties to vent. Yeah. Um, get rid of the frustrations. Hopefully they won't go too far. Mm. You know, I was sitting there thinking, well, I used to be a steward at Hull City. Maybe I can. Yeah. I'm supposed to get. Yeah, it's not your role way, as a yeah. mediator. Yeah. You're not there to yeah. certainly manhandle the parties. Yeah. Um, but yeah, similar similar sort of scenario, and you do. You do think, oh God, I'm in charge here. What am I supposed yeah. to do? Yeah. yeah, I know I'm meant to do something, but I'm not <laughs> sure what that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, uh-huh. Um, again, sticking then with the fact of uh, we're, we're in Northern Ireland at the moment, mm. um, what is the current state of mediation here? Um, there's several um, experimental um, quasi-government funded type arrangements that are being looked at, but um, mediation probably hasn't taken off in the way that some of us either would like to see. Mm-hmm or imagined it would have happened by now. Um, it has been slow, and a large part of that, I believe, is um, funding related. Mm. Um, I, I know um, some organizations um, that are involved with trying to promote mediation here, and the benefits of it, mm. um, have really found it difficult funding-wise, um, as have the um, professions um, that uh, both the solicitor and barrister profession here have uh, both found it um, difficult to find um, a way of cases being funded and therefore their time being covered for being involved within mm. uh, mediation. Um, so there's some moves to try and correct that, but Northern Ireland without a government at the moment mm. um, is, although recent developments, maybe that will change. Um, uh, have led to great insecurity over uh, government support for various initiatives. Mm. Um, so uh, at the moment, I sit as the interim chair for Family Mediation Northern Ireland, and that's a challenge that uh, that organisation faces mm. at the moment. We um, have no uh, real certainty over funding, or the government fu- element mm. of our funding, which is the major part. Mm. Um, we have um, guarantees in place for six months and we're already about two months, I believe, nearly through that. Mm. So there, there is insecurity there within that voluntary sector, if you like, within mm. Northern Ireland. Um, a lot of good work being done, but um, yeah, unfortunately that question mark still hangs uh, until we probably have government ministers mm. uh, appointed. Um, there's going to be there's going to continue to be a great deal of uncertainty. Yeah, and do you get the um, the support through the voucher scheme that they get in England? Do you know what that is? Um, no, I don't think we do. But to go yeah. ahead and explain. Well, it I I don't I do commercial mediation, but you can't help but pick up little bits of information about other things as you go along. Yeah. And I'm 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 pretty sure it's still running now. It was extended, and I may be wrong. Um, but there was a period where. If you were in a family dispute, you could get a voucher to give you five hundred pound to fund a mediation. Yeah. Um, and the mediation bodies who were signed up to that would accept that as, okay. as payment. 
Yeah, I'm not aware of that in Northern mm. Ireland. Um, I know that there has been different um, pilot schemes mm. that have been looked at, and particularly within the likes of areas with, such as family and um, um, uh, civil disputes, um, um, but not, yeah, I'm not aware of any no. voucher scheme. It's a shame. I I always felt when I when I saw that is why can't they do that for commercial disputes as well, mm-hmm. you know, and small businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, one of my um other things I do is I'm a sort of ambassador. I think they call it. I always get embarrassed using that word, um, for the Federation of Small Businesses and looking at the sorts of lower value claims that small businesses get involved in. What a great way to promote the use of mediation and mm-hmm. save the costs of legal fees and also court running costs mm-hmm. if they introduce if the government introduced something similar for commercial disputes as well yeah and i know i mean i sat on the judicial st- steering group here in northern ireland um and i know that the courts have uh, and the judiciary generally have a very uh, positive outlook as respects mediation mm. and its role um i'm aware too of the influences that are coming from your part of the world uh, in England and the master of the rule, Sir Geoffrey Voss, is uh, emphasis now on, on trying to find mm-hmm. uh, alternative or as some of our colleagues might refer to it as appropriate dispute resolution mm-hmm. um, and trying to triage all sorts of cases um, at a much earlier stage to, to try and resolve disputes and assist with trying to clear the backlog that exists uh, in, in various jurisdictions. And I, I know that there is an appetite there um, in Northern Ireland. Um, I suppose it's just, how do you do it? Mm. And um, uh, in a small jurisdiction like our own, um, we tend to look at what others have tried to do. So we'd look at um, states in the likes of Canada, for example, mm. or Australia, in, um, which, which have piloted various uh, efforts of trying to run ADR um, within the court service and court offering. Um, so there, there is an appetite there definitely to try and look at better mm. ways to move forward. Mm. Good, good. Right, going to throw one in here for you. Who's going to win the Six Nations? Well, that's simple. It's it's not even a question mark, is it, Greg? Uh, it, Ireland are, are, are up for the Grand Slam. Do you reckon? Well, provide, <laughs> <laughs> provided we don't get walloped by Scotland <laughs> at the weekend or in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's been a, a great um, tournament so far for an Irish fan. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, no, it's been, been great to watch. Yeah, good, good. Well, obviously I want England to win, but... Mm. Uh, good luck I, with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's always next year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. For, for many years, that's what my wife used to uh, laugh at me about with uh, the kids, because my, my kids, um, even though we live in the south of England, I'm from Liverpool and it was a condition of our marriage mm. that we, if we had children, they support Liverpool. Yeah. So my three kids support Liverpool and they're all as crazy as I am about Liverpool. But for many years when they were growing up, my stock phrase was, there's always next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden we started winning things and now it's back to, oh, there's always next year. <laughs> yeah, believe me, it's growing up in Ireland... Um, we didn't, we didn't, and certainly in rugby circles, we didn't have much to celebrate for many, many <laughs> years, decades, in fact. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been a, we've had a wee bit more to contribute um, over the last, uh, I suppose, 10 or 15 years. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, on, on, on the topic, it's, it's quite topical because um, a Hunt ADR accredited mediator who, who did the training with us two years ago, David Humphreys, of course, mm. former Irish rugby international has yeah. just been appointed uh director of operations at the english and welsh cricket board yeah which is uh, a, a great appointment i think I'm yeah looking forward no, to uh, discussing some, that with him he brings a wealth of experience um yeah. with that uh, a great great uh, out half in his day and mm. uh his uh, influences both here within rugby circles but also some of the great work he did over in um, the English Premiership mm. um, has set him up well for this next role, which, uh, yeah, mm. uh, it's very exciting to see for him. 
Yeah. Well, I was hoping that you'd be coming out for a pint with us in a few weeks, but you yeah. decided well. to <laughs> to go off somewhere else, <laughs> haven't you, for the week? And that, yeah. Not that I'm offended at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been hungry that week uh, with students, but um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll miss that this time. But there's always next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, um, I know that you have got a strong interest in legal tech, mm. um, a passion, I would say, for, for legal tech. Um, do you want to give us a bit of information about how that started and where you are with it? Yeah, um, so I suppose um, it happened around the time that I had qualified as a mediator, and I, I suppose it was a, a natural progression. I noticed things like, um, as we all did, um, you know, the days of taking your daughter down to the local extra vision to pick out a DVD for the weekend, um, only to get there to realise they don't have the one that she wants and that you go for second or third best. Um, you then run up a bill because you keep forgetting to return it and <laughs> by the time you get to return it, you need another one. Mm. Um, so all of that, that world that we all lived in, has gone. Mm. And... Um, now everybody expects just to, from the remote control, order something on Amazon or wherever it might be, Netflix or whatever, um, and we've all moved online. Mm. Um, why have we done that? Because it's more convenient mm. and it's um, technically um, available to us now to do it. Mm. Uh, we've got good broadband at homes, uh, in homes, so uh, all of that. And I suppose as I went on my path from becoming um, a barrister and then looking at mediation and what it could achieve and do an alternative dispute resolution mm. um, generally the next step or progression to me was well why is this not being done more online why why are we not using technology mm. at the heart of this and, and that that's wrong to say we weren't but it wasn't widespread mm. And I suppose um, I um, managed to talk with those that were in the industry that was soon becoming identified as ODR or online dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. And that was a very small world and um, it was quite niche, um, people working on various different solutions. Um, at the time, I had uh, a couple of colleagues that were very interested here in the sort of legal professions mm -hmm. um, who likewise were thinking a wee bit like I was and we started to talk about it and we thought well why shouldn't we do something then so we first of all um, wanted to uh, look at it from a practitioner's point of view and we um, developed um, a product which is now known as Engage it's um, part of uh, a company called Talk Terms mm -hmm. And in, in Engage, it was everything that the dispute resolution professional might need. It was a whole bag of tools, everything that we thought as mediators, arbitrators and adjudicators, because between the three of us, we all were at least one of those. Yeah. Um, I said, well, OK, how do we make our lives easier? Um, you know, how can we make it secure? Because there was a lot of concern about security online and GDPR and other issues. So how do we make it compliant with all of that? How do we make it secure? And how do we make that, uh, rather than challenging as a piece of technology, but um, making people's life easier, mm. um, making the, the party's life easier as well as the professional life, uh, professional's life easier. And, um, and so we came up with Engage. And um, we're very pleased with that. It's uh, at minimum viable uh, product at the moment. That's is at that stage. So... Uh, we are hoping to start testing that um, with a, a, in anger to try and make sure mm -hmm. that we've got all the gremlins out of it. We're quite mm -hmm. happy we've got some of them out, but uh, there's still a work in progress. Um, but another thing that then came um, to us was the need for um, sort of scalable um, solutions as well. Mm -hmm. And so we... we have uh, another aspect of our offering called SWIFT, mm -hmm. which sits as well within talk terms. And SWIFT is about um, uh, speedy, easy uh, resolution of disputes mm -hmm. through negotiation. And the platform encourages the parties um, to find a solution together, a bit like we do in, in mediation. Mm. Um, but it does it without the need of a third-party professional in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we see that as a sort of triage point for a lot of low level disputes within the industry in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, we did some very interesting research here which showed that, I think it was a BEIS report, showed that 43% of, of consumer disputes were for between 50 and £100 pounds mm. annually, which is just incredible, uh, low-level mm. dis- amount of disputes. Um, another piece of research that we had done was uh, a report that Queen Margaret had released, Queen Margaret University, um, within that report, I'm glad you clarified that because I thought you meant Queen Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just the university. Um, they produced a report. Uh, I think it was back around 2017, 2018, something like that. And they found that on average, the insurance industry in Australia on these small level claims were spending se- the equivalent of seven hundred and fifty pounds per dispute. Mm. So we thought look, something has to give here, something has mm. to change. If industry's spending £750 resolving a £50 to £100 dispute, mm. then that's not a wise use of time or resources. No. No. Um, so, yeah, the SWIFT platform was designed um, with users in mind, very, very simple uh, interface, um, and encourages the parties to try and resolve disputes. So we're very keen, again, to try and establish... Pilots within industry, mm-hmm. uh, possibly within the court service as well, uh, for that product, possibly at the, the likes if it was in the court service, it might be something in the, for the small claims court or something like mm. that. Mm, sounds interesting. So how do you think the market's going to develop in the, in the next few years? Uh, crystal ball time. Mm. Um, I, I think the market will be moved in a direction, probably is being moved in a direction actually, to be honest, um, a little bit like you and I decided we stopped going to extra vision mm-hmm. um, and forced the market in a way to mm-hmm. change to our needs and mm-hmm. requirements and desires. I think um, ultimately that's what's going to happen within this marketplace. I think um, people expect to be able to do things from their phone. Yeah. And courts uh, and industry are going to have to adapt mm. to that. And I think, um, you know, some of these organizations, of course, are very large and a little bit antiquated mm. and um, maybe slower to, to adopt to uh, um, technology, the, the changes that technology can bring. But ultimately, I think that's where we will mm. end up. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what solutions, like for example, on, on Swift, um, which I mentioned earlier on, where we, we would like to see the um, use of, uh, in addition to the algorithms that are within the platform, the use of AI mm. um, to possibly, um, again, have the likes of uh, an arbitration decision mm. that um, is... Um, through machine learning or, or, or AI rather than a human. Mm. Um, ultimately, um, I, th- I don't think it's going to do away with all arbitration, mm. arbitrators, I should say, but I think um, at those low levels, how do you pay an arbitrator for a mm. 50 to £100 pound dispute? Mm. How do you, uh, you That's always been the question. Worthwhile. Yeah, no one's never had the, the proper answer for that. Mm. And it's interesting you say about some of the organisations being old and antiquated and whatever... Mm. That they also are very people driven in as much as the membership organisations. Mm-hmm. Um, so the likelihood of members of those organisations wanting those organisations to develop technology which removes the need as much for the member to actually do the work mm-hmm. is is limited. Yeah. I, I would expect. Um, but it's another example of modern life isn't it and and technology takes the place of humans in so many different ways and yeah. the as Colin Rill said a few weeks ago on on the podcast people have got to face up to it it's here AI is here mm-hmm. um, and it's going to only get more and more impactful in ADR yeah so can't ignore it no no I think that's right and you only have to look at how quickly change can be brought about by outside circumstances. So you look at COVID. When I talk to to, um, the likes of mediators 
uh, who were maybe of an age group of in their 50s or 60s mm. talking about using online tools was an anathema to them really mm. they weren't that keen um, our common arguments that were put up was well you don't get the feeling of being in the room mm. and you need to be able to read the uh, the, the parties and, and of course that's correct but um, along come COVID and the mm. only real way of doing it was and, and to stay working mm. and uh, resolving disputes mm. as a mediator was to get online mm. and I think people found it actually um, their fears weren't lived out mm. um, in actual fact they the experience has been uh, largely a positive one mm. and the convenience of it um, um, to various organisations um, has been uh, ha- has been useful, I think. Mm. Um, ultimately, the cost of mediation, if it's being done online, it can be uh, pa- perhaps tailored um, to the dispute um, without having parties travelling and mm. o- hiring rooms and all the rest of it Mm. so ultimately that brings down the cost and therefore makes it more accessible to people Mm. um so um is it perfect no Mm -hmm. but what is perfect a human a human's perfect yeah yeah i'll be honest with you i think i i've never felt this way about anything before i've never felt i wish i was 25 again because x y and z Mm. But this makes me think, God, I wish I was 25 again, mm. because I've still got probably the ideas I would have at 25, mm-hmm. but I've got a mortgage and three kids and two of them are going yeah. through university. Yeah, times are different. Yeah. Um, but imagine having all this power and potential at your fingertips, yeah. being sort of in uni or just out of uni, and yeah. it's just, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's something we hope to, to you know, that age group mm. um, is really our master's profile um, mm. of student. But we're also very keen to develop, we here uh, at Ulster have a legal innovation centre. Mm. And we're very, very keen to look at the role of ADR and ODR within that um, mm. centre. Um, we have a clinic here, a, a law clinic, um, mm. and... Uh, advise uh, in employment matters uh, and soon commercial matters as well um, so yeah we're, we're very interested in, in looking at it in the round with students and certainly harnessing students ideas um, and backing them um, mm. to, to find ways to uh, make alternative dispute resolution more accessible making justice more accessible um, and yeah uh, we're keen to hear their ideas and, and try to back them and, and promote them. Mm. Um, no, nothing would make us happier than to see um, some of these solutions being found by our own students. Yeah. So, John, another thing um, that we've done some work together on mm. uh, in the last six to nine months was the um, BIS scheme for um, commercial rent disputes um, brackets coronavirus yeah um you were central in um possibly getting the most cases through that scheme i, I don't know for, for certain but from what i've heard anecdotally from others um the more arbitrations have gone through your scheme than than maybe the others do you want to talk a little bit about how that arose and, and what you've learned from it yeah, um, so I'm a co-founder of a company called CCODR, which is the sort of service end, if you like, of um, our online dispute resolution. So talk terms focused on um, the technology developments where CCODR d- developed uh, a, a code that was trading standards approved. Um, that code was meant to bring about um, a secure environment for online dispute resolution to protect both professionals and those using it. Mm-hmm. Um, we were made aware by trading standards that, I think it was through trading standards, that uh, BIS were going to run a scheme for uh, commercial rent arrears um, and that they wanted to use arbitration or a, a, a form of arbitration, mm. I suppose, is the best way to describe it. Mm. Um, to try and assist those that had got caught up with um, arrears and coronavirus, mm. uh, due to coronavirus. So 
Uh, we put forward a bid, as you know, we mm-hmm. worked together on that bid and um, your uh, panel of arbitrators at Hunt ADR uh, really uh, helped us make that possible, the offering. So we had um, a, a focus on the online element of mm-hmm. it, how we were going to deliver that. And you were able to bring together your team of um, arbitrators. Mm-hmm. And um, between us, we put together quite a strong offering. Mm. Um, again, though, what concerned us was that arbitration can be uh, quite an expensive process. Mm. And um, one of the concerns that we had was that this scheme was dealing with people who were in real difficulty mm. and facing possibly having to close. Mm. Um, so we had to be sensitive to that. Mm. And so we built it from the ground up, if you like as to a cost price um, that we thought that uh, would, would make it permissible for, the, for parties to, to try and get uh, a resolution that find themselves in difficult circumstances mm. because of COVID. Um, so, you know, that aspect of accessibility was very important mm. to us. Um, making it convenient and as quick as we could mm. was also very important to us. Um, and yeah, we were delighted to be part of the scheme. I believe I'd, I'd need to check with my uh, other co-founder, but I believe we had 74 cases possibly, mm, like that, yeah. um, uh, which was fantastic um, to, to get that. Uh, it probably wasn't as wide a scheme as mm. the government maybe had in mind originally. Mm. Um, uh, and I don't know about other uh, organisations, how they found um, the numbers. But um, certainly we were kept busy. Yeah, yeah. Now I think it's been a really good scheme and a really good example of how arbitration within a set of its own defined rules can be used to deal with a particular issue in one particular sector. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be um, an open-ended process by developing scheme rules and criteria for use of the scheme. You can really target it down. Um, and I think that's a good example of doing that. And finally then, just you've covered a lot there in terms of lots of different hats that you wear. Mm. But if somebody wanted to contact you to talk about any of them, Mm. what's the best single way for them to contact you? Probably just through my uh, university email, Mm -hmm. um, j.keers at Mm -hmm. ulster.ac.uk. Very, very interested in collaborating with others. be it academically, professionally, um, through uh, legal technology developments. Um, we're very open um, to, to look at um, how we can, I suppose, make an impact, mm. which is really what we want, all of us want to do. Um, mm. You know, to a certain degree, we're at the start of a, a, an industry here and um, mm. the start of a, a new way of doing things. and pioneers in that way I suppose so it would be nice um, yeah to uh, stay involved with that yeah and I'd say to to people listening if you've got an interest in any of that stuff that John was talking about do get in touch with him Um, from my experience he's a he's a grand lad to work with as as he'd say Um, and yeah lots of good ideas and lots of opportunity I think Um, looking to the future for different ways to, to do things and approach things and I think a little bit like I try to be in, in some regards as well just because something's been done in a certain way for God knows how many years doesn't mean it's got to be done that way yeah. and there can be better and newer ways of doing it and um, so yeah get in touch with John get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with John um, we can have a beer go have some dinner as long as you're paying uh, and take it from there all right thanks John thanks for your time Thank you, Greg. And I hope everybody has enjoyed this episode of No Dispute in That. Bye now. That's all for today from No Disputing That. I hope our discussions have helped you to learn more about the world of mediation and arbitration. As we come to a close, I want to thank you for listening in and thank my special guests for their insightful advice and ideas. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to leave me a voice message and you might even be featured on a future episode. Until next time, this is me, Gregory Hunt, signing off. 
Thank you so much for joining me and have a wonderful day.